I'm damn excited. You know what I'm excited about? I'm about to get my ass in my car and go across the city from Clayton into Kensington to interview Will and Rupert from Ubalum Distillery. It's the newest distillery in Kensington. It makes a lethal regimental gin as well as some stunning rakia and rum. Now I'm going to get excited because I'm already late. I've got to get moving. People, my people, welcome to yet another edition from the still. I've got William and Rupert. These are the creative minds, the geniuses behind Nubulum Distillery, which I'm told is Kensington's newest, best, and hottest gin distillery. <laughs> so, how's the last couple of months been? Pretty good. We've been open for a couple of months. Um, so, yeah, lots of people coming in and trying out what we do. Um, yeah, good. In fact, it should be noted, we've just had one of the construction workers from across the street come in and ask what the fuck we do in here. And it's a case of, uh, make ready for booze. Why? It's you know, too the R version, show up when you finish your shift and we can vlog you some. Yeah. You some. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, been busy, float out six days a week, um, setting this new bench work. Are you the go-to drinking hole in Kensington yet? Uh, probably not. Um, but we're definitely the go-to for coming down and drawing some new Venetian cocktails and new and different from normal distiller uh, spirits. That's certainly well, I've been working, <coughs> working on cocktails. Found out that there's more to a dog's nose than um, over in the corner. Yeah. Delicious stuff. <laughs> so, okay. The other big question that's going to be really difficult is, I understand there's a Ukrainian heritage. Yeah, so not directly, so not myself personally, but some of my close friends are Ukrainian. And uh, when we decided to try and turn this into a business a few years ago, their grandmother uh, took me out the back and showed me how she was making spirits. And um, that was one of the motivators for some of the spirits that we make here. So she was making uh, apricot, what we call rakia, or apricot spirit, and then aging it in barrels to have like a nice mellow brown color. And yeah, that was one of the, uh, the motivators for what we're doing. I yeah, moved from Queensland to Melbourne in 95, um, and I moved to St Albans. I had no idea about the cultural differences in Melbourne suburbs at all, so I just picked a place and moved here. Uh, and then all, all of my friends were from, you know, countries like Croatia, Serbia, Hungary, Macedonia, um, and all of them effectively had a grandmother or grandfather in their family who made spirits traditionally. Um, mm. And so me, as a, you know, just becoming into 18 years old, the first spirits I ever tried were spirits that these families were making traditionally. And I had no idea that it was different to what anybody else drank as a spirit, not for years and years. Um, and then, yeah, fast forward in time to this Ukrainian family that I'm good friends with and I realised that she's effectively making the same product in the yard that these other families were making which is fermented fruit so you take your excess fruit from your season ferment that and then distill it into a clear spirit mm. I mean when I got to Melbourne I, I did a butchering apprenticeship <clears throat> so the mere idea of me and sharp knives in the same place causes my darling wife to go very pale because <laughs> I'm so clumsy you, you've met the um, graceful aspie you know, you've no. heard about the graceful aspie yeah, you want to hear about it again? Um, just so utterly <laughs> fucking clumsy. And back in the 1990s, the Italians would you know, get together once a year, make salami, and then distill grappa. Yeah, it exactly. It was you know, about middle of the year. <clears throat> we'd we'd you know, mince up a whole lot of, about three or four pigs from our Italian families. And what are you doing with this? Well, you know, we're, we're making salamis, and whilst we're doing it, we're going to start distilling grappa so we can all get completely shit faced whilst we're making the salamis mm -hmm. to help pass the time. Yep. Because just don't wave any matches near the um, near the salami making shed, or otherwise, there's <laughs> going to be a very big fucking smoking hole on the ground and ball. And <laughs> yeah, well, we, we've got another family that we're good friends with who are Italian, and they do that every year. So every year they have what's called sauce day, and all of their friends come over, they mince up all the tomatoes, and they make it into, and they bottle it into. Um, uh, like big kind of tomato sauce bottles and you use it throughout the year on your pasta and stuff. Mm. And then they, they, they all still make grappa that I'm aware of in their backyards. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating, but you were talking, <coughs> sorry, this happens the way there's that magic little frog at the moment you start getting on camera. <coughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I haven't been drinking this morning. I tend to drink tonight. You were explaining off camera the differences between things because for the average and I'm going to work that some of the people watching this are at least as white as what my face is and certainly whose face is yours and they don't understand the fundamental differences because 
This is the gin. This I have drunk, and when I saw William this morning, my response to, to, words to him were, you've absolutely fucking nailed it. <laughs> um, if you hit that any fucking harder, it'd be a B-52 bomber. I swear to God. Um, as people who've swirled their way through about a kilolitre of gin in the last two and a half years. Yep. Um, this, for those of you watching at home and the adults, um, absolutely fucking nails it. If you're going to produce one gin, this is the gin to, yep. to produce. I cannot sing the, the prices of that highly because even in an industry where there's 800 distillers, last time I checked, and it's they're like mushrooms, they just keep on popping up. Yep. Um, with the amount of competition you've got, that is absolutely fucking like I say, just hits it with a sledgehammer. Hits yep. it with a B fifty two bomber. There's no fucking around. It's a first rate gin. Well, I'm glad you like it. The um, so technically here at this location, we distill Raki and Ram as we've been talking about. Um, but we added a gin to the family because um, I really wanted a like a neat original style gin. So we we love our history. We're history buffs here. So back in the 1800s, if you were um, serving in any any of the military arms of the United Kingdom, if you're in the army, your your jot of courage in the morning was gin. If you're in the navy, your jot of courage in the evening was rum. Um, and so it was the a gin was the, the the army drink. So what we wanted to do here was recreate what gin would have been like if you'd been served it in that late 1800s period in that kind of context, which is why we call it regimental gin. So if I'm a rather stuck up Englishman up on the packet on the northwestern frontier looking at those damn Afghans. Brown people. God. Um, that's what you're gonna be serving me. Well, probably not that person. He's probably drinking something fancy. But all the men down in the dirt, this is what they're drinking. Oh, so the grunts are getting yep, that stuff. They're getting this stuff. Oh, um, so that's cool. the that's the regimental gin. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's juniper forward and not really much else going on. Like it's it's actual gin as it was back in those days. I always thought that being an officer was, was overrated. If you're drinking that stuff, you guys, yeah, I'll be a grunt. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't promote me. I, I'm, honestly, I'm a terrible officer. Because um, you were saying that um, one reason why you've made this gin is because you were getting served potentially great cocktails that were made by gins that simply weren't the, doing the job. You're, they weren't bad gins. I mean, Bombay Sapphire yeah. sells by the gigalitre the year because yep. not because it's a shit gin. It's a perfectly workable gin, but it's not a gin that you would want. It's not an all-purpose gin. It's not there for every occasion. Yeah. And so all, you made that because exactly. of that reason. All the gins, in, uh, like, you know, there's, a, there's a, so many gin distilleries in Victoria. They're all making great gins. Um, and I like almost all of them. But to, as soon as you want to put it into, in my case, a martini, there's just too much other flavors in there. So this is just going back to the basics, gin martini, this is what you should make it from. So very zen, yeah, so yeah, yeah. clear cut, yeah. all the flavors are there. You're not having the citrus comp competing with the juniper, exactly. competing with the aniseed. Yeah, oh, and if it's a dirty martini, competing with the olive. Yeah, you really want that, um, you just want that components of the martini to shine. Excellent. Now, you mentioned rum. Yes. I can see our rum. So we do, all of our rum here is released by the barrel um, and so barrel to barrel you'll get differences in flavor within the rum um, and again we love our we love our history so rum rum is this color because way back in the 1600s um, if you're on a ship a British ship or actually probably any of the navies but we'll stick with the UK uh, they, they want to take their rum from the shore and then have it with them for their four-month journey so what are they gonna do they can store it in barrels mm. and they put it in a barrel and it comes out looking like this um, so rum is like all spirits distilled clear, but the brown and the colouring and the flavours all come from the so barrel that's been put in. Goes in that colour. Yep. Six months in a, in a leaky boat, wandering around the South Pacific, and you end up that yep. colour. That's exactly right. Um, there's a there's a there's a great story about how the first cocktail was invented. Have you heard this from Sir Francis Drake? Hit me. Um, so in the late 1500s, Sir Francis Drake is kicking about in one of his ships in the in the Caribbean somewhere. Yeah, raiding, and, uh, the, raiding the Spanish and... Uh, pretty much, yeah, doing all sorts killing. of licensed piratry, um, you know, endorsed by the monarch of the time. And um, he, could, he couldn't get his men to eat enough citrus. Yep. And so they were all getting scurvy. So yep. what he did was he grabbed a whole bunch of citrus juice, mixed it up with some rum, put some sugar in there, put some other ingredients, and made, made a drink which is very, very similar to what we would call today a mojito. And then his men on the ship drank it, and they got less scurvy. And so that's happy. that's yeah, that's the uh, origin story. So the, the the myth of the first cocktail was on a on a on a ship being pirated by a, by an English pirate, 
excuse me, being captained by an English pirate in the Caribbean. Privateer. Privateer, Because yes. he was in the service of Her Majesty <laughs> Queen Elizabeth number one. One. I yeah, imagine at the time. It's about the right period, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it's because she was the one who took the British from a very small yeah. navy and went, screw it, there's only one, there's only one cash register out there that we're going to hit. Yep. And it sails across the Atlantic full of um, gold. Yeah. gold. And that's why what Drake was actually doing. And, and the, re- the reason we they put rum in barrels is because another Sir Francis Drake story is he, he sacked the, he was in, um, he sacked a Spanish ship at one point and stole all their cherry barrels. Correction, their brandy barrels and brought them back to England. Actually, I think it was the sherry barrels. And then England all of a sudden had all these excess barrels, so they just put all their spirits in them, and then they got these amazing colours and flavours out of them. That's the origin story of, of ageing scotch in um, sherry barrels. I actually heard that. Yes. Yeah. I did that masterclass with Amber Lane, and he was guess if yeah, um, so someone actually had hijacked a whole lot of Spanish shit. That's right. It's free, and we just... Yep. We, no, it's no longer owned there by anyone. Why? We just shot him, and it's not. It's free. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, no one owns it. And waked it in, and sure enough, um, yep. because I think most... Scotch whiskey is actually aged in sherry barrels yeah. these days. So. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's a, there's a shortage at the moment. Um, they um, they licensed exporting them from Spain. But anyway, so what we do, so we have we always have two rums. Um, they're both from the same barrel, but one is how it comes out of the barrel, what we call barrel strength, mm-hmm. and the other we we bring it down to in low forwards. This one's forty four percent, and that one's fifty two percent. And so we want we always keep. The, the, the stronger one around because we want to, we want you to have the flavour that you would have got straight out of the barrel if you'd been a sailor back in that period and that's what this would have tasted like you should have a pirate night <laughs> yes a pirate theme tonight yeah a pirate theme night <laughs> it's going to be saving it no because um, doing a whole menu of, or a theme night of this is what you would if you were being a buccaneer in, in you know, 1460 this is exactly what you'd be actually drinking at the time yeah I think that would be Fascinating to research at the very least. Yeah. What were they drinking apart from the fact that no quality control and it was more likely any that rougher was barking, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing is that the aging in barrel actually takes some of the roughness out of those spirits, um, which is what the, another reason why we do it these days. Like we put spirits in the barrels to have that like mellowness introduced. So. Well, also, um, as my friend Rod said to me, is that he they bought a raw barrel from the cooperage in the United States and then got one of the regular ones and then weighed the difference mm-hmm. and realised that they were picking up about 10 litres of aged bourbon for every barrel that they were putting the whiskey in mm-hmm. and he went if he knew a bargain we saw when, he, when they realised just how much free booze and free chemistry they were picking up yep okay so yeah absolutely so okay moving right along you mentioned rakia yep. which is the pear yep is it any particular variety of pear uh, for this particular batch, it's not. So this is just a Australian, a Victorian grown pears. Um, the there is some difference in the variety of the pear into the end product. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a because we want to keep the pear rakia in stock all year round rather than have it seasonal, we will just change the variety of the pear as the, as the year goes round. Because there's always a pear that's ripe somewhere in Australia <laughs> yeah. that we can get our hands on. Um, so no no particular variety on the on the pear rakia, um, and then. The, the one in your hand there is our uh, plum rakia. We haven't got the labels for it yet, but that's the actual spirit in the bottle. So that's um, that's known in a lot of countries to be slivervitz. So slightly cloudy. Yes. Yep. All all these all rakia is, is cloudy because it's all distilled from the from the fruit itself. Um, and just while we're on that note, that's why we're called New Billum. It's Latin for cloudy. Ah, um, that's good. That was the other big question I was going yeah. to ask you. The really challenging one. Where the fuck did you get that name? Yeah, from? yep, it's it's Latin for cloudy. So think about cumulus, nimbilus, yeah, um, nubilus. They're all just types of clouds. So nubilum is cloudy. Um, and then yeah, if you, it, it's hard to see that it is cloudy spirit, but as soon as you put it next to something like a like a gin, you can see that they aren't um, entirely clear. And of course, the rum's not clear at all. Yeah, no, no, it makes a perfect contrast. Oh, that's fascinating. So you named it after clouds. Mm-hmm. Yep. And with your background, yeah. So the, actually, I'll get the I'll get you a, a nip of the blueberry, and you can. Yes. Have a taste of that while we. Oh, hang on! Is this a new one? This is a new one. Ooh! You I might want to tell the audience about this one. I'll come back and talk about it while I'm in front of you. Awesome. Yeah, that's fine. That's 
had red. So, um, because rakia is such a traditional drink all through Europe, and we talked about this off camera, but in, in, in Germany, if you're from Germany or Austria and you drink a product called Schnapps, it's going to be very similar to what we've made, not very similar to what the products, some of the products are available in Australia, which are also great, but they're not the same as this. Mm -hmm. And then also all, all of Central Europe has a tradition of fermenting the leftover fruit and then distilling it into a, a fairly potent spirit, somewhere between 40 and 60% is the average. Um, we try and keep ours down in the low 40s to make it more drinkable um, but yeah we've just developed our new drink now which is blueberry rock here um, so all of these blueberries come from one farm on the Mornington Peninsula and all of their blueberries come to us and they're a German family that owns it so we're making it into blueberry rock here um, and then it comes out of the, as we talked about the clear spirit so this does come out of the still clear and we distill this at about 78 percent and then we macerate it in the blueberry skins that we've had left over from the uh, fermentation process and you can see that that lovely color there that's not artificial that's completely blueberry reminds me of my childhood um, coming home staying from our end to wherever with the mulberry trees yes so, <laughs> it took weeks to, weeks to get that out of the out of the wash yeah well when I picked mulberries you, your hands would be stained that color for about 10 days when, when I was a child in Queensland um, but yeah you have a put a little bit in there so this is, um, this is what we'll be launching soon as our premium rakia product. Premium partially because it's so nice, but also because blueberries are an um, uncommon fruit to have chosen to make into rakia. Also, they're all blueberries. I'm thinking um, blackberries. I'm pouring a bit extra so that my other half yep. can sample. So just, to, I know that's an unlabeled bottle. So this spirit is 38%. So okay. it, it is a genuine spirit. It's not a liqueur. And... Uh, it's single distilled. It's still got that rakia feel to the spirit, which is the, the green. You can almost taste the feel the fruit on your tongue, which is how rakia should be. And uh, and then, yeah, a little bit of blueberry skin afterwards, and there you've got that product. I like it. Um, one complaint about Western meat is that it's just protein. You know, yeah. Everything tastes the same. But you guys, are with your spirits, in case of no, fuck it. If I'm making a um, pear, pear rakia or if I'm making blueberry, I actually want to taste what the fuck has gone into the yep. into the barrel. Yep. So it's actually interesting to um, eat. I spent time in Southern Thailand, uh, North East Thailand, sorry, when my first marriage was ending because my ex-wife wanted me to ordain as a monk. It's <laughs> hmm. so later and three kids later, we know how that worked. Yep. Um, but I love to feed up in, in the East um, because I get chicken put into my bowl and stuff like that and I'll yep. taste chicken, I taste pork. Yeah. You come here and it's, you know, the mouthfeel and the taste is... Yeah. One of, one, of the big, one of the big ways we use to explain to people how what we're making is different is people think pear raki is going to taste strongly like pear and be sweet. It's a little bit of pear in it, but it, it's made from the pear. So... Oh, honey. <laughs> Later. No. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be gone. You're driving. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, the difference is that um, most spirits that have got fruit on the label are flavored with the fruit mm. well the fruit is added to the spirit after distillation um this is actually fermented blueberries and then distilled through and same with the pear same with the plum um so so gin done the same way a lot of neat alcohol and then you basically yes. soak the fruit in yep and, that's uh, right no, i mean down. all gins technically are made in that second method they're either in a gin basket in the still or they're macerated some sort of flavor is macerated in um, the, the, the source of the ethanol in gin is arbitrary to the gin maker. The mm. source of the ethanol in rakia is from the fruit. Yep. Um, sangria. This, yes. This will make a absolutely lethal sangria. Yeah. Well, we, we've <coughs> got two cocktails that we're demoing with this product. But yes, yeah, so this is our premium rakia product. Um, and... Uh, what, the way we recommend you drink our regular rakia is with tonic or, or neat, if that's what your cultural heritage is, drink it neat. But a lot of people are expecting a gin. They expect it to taste and feel like gin, but it's not. It's from fruit. So, um, but this one, we, we want to make it so it's sippable on its own and an amazing in a cocktail. Absolutely. I mean, my, my cultural heritage is um, alcoholic, so um, <laughs> I'm actually from North Queensland where <clears throat> Bergen's rule and... Um, Bundy rum is actually acceptable as a yeah. drink, um, despite the fact I actually gave my darling wife some Bundy rum. She tried it neat. 
And she looked at me and went, this is just it's absolutely vile. <laughs> yep. And I said, well, it's usually drunk with Coke. And then she looked at me and she went, okay, now it's absolutely vile, but it's got Coca-Cola with it. Yeah. Um, so there is not a lot of drinking culture up in North Queensland, certainly not in the early 1980s. I think it's changing now with tan lines in Tasman, in Townsville, and there's three or four distilleries happening around Cairns at the moment. Mm-hmm. Not that I've been back home since... When was the last time we were back home? 17. Yeah, I haven't been back in seven years. Eight years. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is wicked. I mean... Yeah. I love the colour of it. Can you see the colour of this? My darling wife is off camera. So, can you see it? Mm. It's very it's very much that almost blood red. It yeah. reminds me of a mix of the colour of uh, ripe cherries and the colour of beetroot. That's the colour palette that I'm yeah. getting. Yeah, but it's not going to be like beetroot. Of course it's not going to be like beetroot. <laughs> <laughs> My father was a notorious hypochondriac. And um, one day he had a whole lot of beetroot for lunch. So he passes, eats beetroot for lunch, goes off, passes, you know, has, has a leap, and it's bright red, it's this color. So <gasps> renal failure, races off to the doctor. Doctor, doctor, I'm dying, I'm dying. Oh, okay, Ray, give, give us a sample. My father hands over a sample. I'm dying, doctor, don't do, kidneys are failing, doctor. I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on my last legs, doctor, type stuff. Anyway, the doc- you can hear the doctor laughing. And my father was not known for his wacky sense of humour. Anyway, the doctor comes out and he's laughing. You know, he says, well, yeah, okay, Ray. Oh, what, yeah, what's the funny? Dying man here, kidney failure. You know, I'm, ble- I'm bleeding through my kidneys. I'm dying. Um, beetroot too much. What's that got to do with me? I'm dying. There's blood in my urine. No, you idiot. The, um, the red colour in beetroot is the only plant product that actually will pass through the entire system hmm. and come out. So my father had, had, had actually had beta carotene poisoning. He'd eaten way too much beetroot for lunch and then went off and passed water and was convinced he was dying. <laughs> My mother told me about it um, and then she finished it, and this was after she was divorced and she said, see, I always told you he was an idiot. <laughs> he was an idiot with, weight, with, with liking for beetroot and no sense of yep. So yeah, that's our, that's our blueberry record. When does this come out? Oh, in a couple of weeks. In a couple yep. of weeks. So, it's getting uh, cold. Well, actually, it's going to be longer than that. It's going to be mid-May. Mid-May. Yeah. So we have some available now, but the um, the labels haven't arrived, and uh, we've got a fair bit to do between now and the end of April. So mid-May, we'll do a um, we'll do a. You'll see something on our social media, on our Instagram, um, mm. leading up to a day when we kind of launch this product. Mother's Day. Potentially, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Get get all the um, get all the mums in here and yep. for the half price cocktails and. In case you can drink until you like your kids. Social <laughs> links in the description, remember that. Sorry? Social links in the description of the video, remember that. I always put social links in the, dis- in the description. Mm. Mm. So is my darling wife going to come on camera? No, I am not, having said that. <laughs> um, anything you want to say? No, no, I think we've covered absolutely everything. Yeah. I'm more than happy with this because I did an interview two weeks ago and two seconds in my mind went blank. And then the battery on the microphone died. Hmm. And he goes, <laughs> You idiot! <clears throat> yeah, that fortunately didn't get on mic. Um, but no, no, I'm very happy. So, people, my people, this is William and Rupert. This is New Willem Distillery. If you are in the western suburbs, don't be a tool. Get your ass down here. You're open Wednesday to Wednesday till Sunday. Wednesday to Sunday, midday till. So, Saturday, Sunday from 1 pm, and on weekdays from 4 pm. So stay, stay tuned. There is going to be some <clears throat> wicked, oh, well, there already is plenty of wicked stuff. Cocktails coming out. This is the different the um, booze that you've got to drink because it's not snaps, it's rakia. Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're talking Ukrainian, not German. This is the rum that um, there was a cocktail I made with rum in it recently. Two different types of rum, absolutely wicked. And this is the rum for that screaming cold winter that we're going to come. Yep. <clears throat> because in the western suburbs, the frosts are deep and yes. it gets really cold because we're sitting on basalt out here. Mm-hmm. And the basalt plains are just oh, horribly cold. And so this will keep you warm through winter. Yes, it's the yep. um, heart starter, the, in- the fire in the engine, the um, pilot light to the, to the heater. So this is New Berlin Distillery. We're in Ken- they're in Kensington. 
Um, we're close to public transport, so if you want to go out and buy way too much, um, Macaulay Station is staggering distance, about 300 metres over way. my shoulder. Yep, and Kensington Station in the other direction. So right between them. Absolutely staggering distance. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, I, I, I went to the bar and um, 